Hello guys and girls, Raj here, back with another video. In this video, we are going to look at S3 versus EVS versus HDFS versus EFS. So this is how this video is going to go. We are going to start in the beginning where we are going to explore what is object, block, file and DFS. Then we are going to go over the good old comparison chart where you go over the features and use cases for each one of these. Then we are going to discuss architectures and use cases with our pen and paper architect. And finally, I'm going to share the tips on how to answer this comparison kind of questions in an interview. Okay, so we have a lot in our plate. Let's get started. Let's start with object. So what is an object? You can think of object as literally any file like your text file, image file, music, movie file, etc. And what is object storage? Object storage is a computer data storage architecture that manages data as objects, such as S3. It's also known as simple storage service. Uh, it's storage through web service interface, like you don't need to attach a server to grab the stuff. S3 is 12 and a half years old at this point. Uh, so I assume most of, most of you folks know uh, how to put stuff in S3 and get it out using AWS console. Uh, so that's the web service interface. And also it's highly scalable, available and durable. Now, let's say you are writing a book on zombies, right? And you stored that whole book, zombies.txt, uh, which is our object in the S3 bucket. Now let's say you want to update that book. So you updated the book and now you want to save the updated book in the S3 bucket. See, the thing with object storage is uh, the whole object needs to be replaced, right? So you change the book and uh, you have to just re-upload the whole zombies.txt and the zombies.txt gets uploaded into S3 bucket. So for large objects, it is time consuming. It is also slower because think of it, uh, every time you have to uh, upload a file or even download part of the file, let's say uh, you want to read specifically about one zombie, instead of fetching one particular part of this object, you have to download the whole zombies.txt from S3. However, one thing I do want to mention is uh, S3 multi-part upload download. So you can mention this to impress your interviewer. So multi-part upload allows you to upload a single object as set of parts. So basically this one object, you can split into parts. Let's say part one, part two, part three, and each of these parts can be parallelly uploaded. Similarly, while downloading, you can break this object into three different parts and parallelly download it. So multi-part upload download makes upload download parallelly and faster. However, you have to coordinate this breaking into parts, calling API appropriately with the parts to upload it, handle abort in case of something goes wrong, etc. Also, this is recommended for objects larger than 100 megabyte. One thing to note, even with uh, parts, there is no way to selectively fetch part of the object, right? Um, even if you want to get a part of it, uh, you still have to make a multi-part and download the whole object. Now let's take a look at block storage. For block storage, any data is broken into multiple blocks and stores those blocks as separate pieces. So if we take a look at our favorite book, which is zombies.txt, it's gonna broken into multiple blocks. Let's say from B1, B2, B3, B4, to let's say BN. And if the book is updated, it can have some intelligence that it can just go and update the block that's changed. Also different blocks can be parallelly uploaded and downloaded, making it much, much faster. So block level operation is faster than object level. And all this block level upload, download is automatic behind the scene. You focus on your business problem. Remember, for object, multi-part, upload, download, you had to coordinate all that stuff, right? But here, it is all done for you. 
Also, default block size is 256 kilobyte, which is much smaller than uh, a part in multi-part. Also, this is associated with SAN or storage area network. So how do you access this block storage, right? So this block storage in AWS is known as EBS or Elastic Block Storage. You can think of that as like your hard disks for your computer. So to access your hard disk, you have to attach your hard disk to your processor or server or CPU. Similarly, to access the EBS in AWS, you have to attach it to an Amazon EC2 or Elastic Compute Cloud. So block storage is very fast. However, it could be very expensive. And let's say our favorite book is stored into multiple blocks. And let, let's say this block B3 gets corrupted or goes bad, right, in your hard disk. Uh, so basically, this whole uh, book is corrupted now. You cannot grab that block anymore. So how do you store lots of data a cheaper and in a durable fashion. So distributed file system solves that problem. Uh, so instead of saving into 256 kilobyte chunks of blocks, it saves it into a larger block. Let's say B1, B2 to uh, B6. And for each of these blocks, it replicates and saves it into multiple places. So let's say this block B2 will be saved in cheap or commodity hardware one, commodity hardware two, and commodity hardware three. And even if one of the hardware fails, it can still retrieve the block from the other places. So a couple of points about DFS. Uh, so the file blocks distributed over commodity hardware, that's why the name distributed file system came into place. Uh, and then the system automatically replicates. Uh, so one thing to note, uh, in this case, each block is being replicated three times. That's also known as replication factor. Uh, so by default, it is three, but you can change it. So this block size is way larger than EBS. Uh, each block by default is 128 megabyte, and it is suited for big file. Uh, remember, smallest size that can be updated is block, right? So uh, let's say you um, update one megabyte it still has to go and update that 128 megabyte block, which leads us into HDFS or Hadoop distributed file system. Uh, it is highly scalable and fault tolerant, uh, and it supports parallel reading and processing uh, using MapReduce. You can query the data uh, using a technology called Hive, and it is utilized in AWS services, such as AWS Athena to query S3, Amazon EMR or Elastic Map Reduce, etc. So going back to our uh, EBS or Elastic Block Storage, uh, to process, remember we had to attach EC2, but one EBS can be attached to only one EC2. But what if your zombie books are getting very popular and multiple processes wants to read it and uh, update it, and that's not possible with EBS. So that's why file storage came into play. So for file storage, one file can be accessed through multiple servers. So the file storage in AWS is known as EFS or Elastic File Storage. Uh, it scales automatically. Uh, so let's say all these servers are putting new files into this EFS, it will automatically expand. And um, if the number of files reduce, it will automatically goes down in size. Simultaneous read writes from multiple servers. And this is a nice feature uh, for EFS. You pay what you use. And this is also associated with NAS or network attached storage. So in this video, I'm not going to go deep on SAN versus NAS, but if you guys want me to make another video on that, let me know and I can create another lecture on that. So now that we understand what is object, block, distributed file system and file system, uh, let's take a look at the good old comparison chart. Okay, I'm not going to go through each one of these uh, because I was editing the video and if I go through each one of these, the video is over 20 minutes long. Um, so you guys can take a screenshot of this and then use it to study. However, a couple things I want to point out is uh, for the pay, uh, for EBS, you pay for unused capacity 
Uh, what I mean by that is uh, S3, HDFS, EFS, the side scales, right? So if you are using 500 megabyte of storage, you are just gonna pay for that 500 megabyte. However, EBS comes with a uh, fixed uh, capacity. Um, so let's say you attach a 10 terabyte EBS to EC2, and even if you are using 500 megabyte out of 10 terabyte, you will pay for the full price. And another thing is there are overlapping between these technologies, uh, like S3 and HDFS have some overlapping components. Uh, so when doing use cases, uh, it's okay. You can go one way or another based on your requirements. So taking it all in, how do you pick right tool for right job? I want to start this section by quoting one of my favorite quote. Do not use a cannon to kill a mosquito. Always dive deep. The pen and paper architect might say, Ooh, S3 is slow. Use EBS every time. But you should always remember that slow is a relative term. So you should always push back and say, can we discuss specific use case, response time requirement, cost factors, etc., and then choose appropriately. So let's take a look at a sample use case, bill storage and retrieval. So it is a system which stores the bill and customers generally don't access bills older than three months. A bill retrieval time in seconds okay, a no need for millisecond response and need to save bill for seven years. You can pause the video and think about which storage system you will go for. So pen and paper architect may say, I have just the perfect idea. Save the bills in database. But you should think through that fetching an object from S3 can be done within seconds and to save an object in S3 for seven years will be much cheaper than saving data in database. And you could uh, take advantage of S3 tiering uh, to save older bills. Let's take a look at another use case, acquiring large data. So amount of data is on petabyte scale. Uh, data is a mix of unstructured, semi-structured, and structured. And a query is not from the transactional system. It's more like a data warehouse kind of query. And in future, uh, dashboards are planned. So pen and paper architect may say, Aha! Querying means only one thing, database. Let's spin up fastest RDS possible with fastest DBS then buy shiny dashboard software license. However, you could achieve the same using S3 to store the data, use Amazon Athena to query data, and then we can build a dashboard in QuickSight. Another AIML use case, a pen and paper architect might go, My best friend is in AIML. I suggest loading data into database, write ML programs on EC2, and see that thing run. However, you could do S3 to store data, SageMaker to run machine learning, and have profit. Last use case, a non-prod web server. So this is where you need to install uh, some softwares. So pen and paper architect may say, Finally, some EBS action. Give me some provisioned IOPS SSD EBS. Uh, so provisioned IOPS is the most expensive kind of EBS. Um, so you should look into your input output per second requirement. And if possible, use a general purpose SSD or GP2 EBS, uh, which can save you a lot of money. Also, you should check if you can migrate that traditional web server APIs to serverless. Okay, so this brings us to our last section is uh, how to answer this kind of comparison questions in interview. Uh, like this question is very, very common. Like, hey, tell me when you're gonna use uh, block-based storage or object-based storage, etc. So remember, uh, focus on why, uh, not what. Like if you say, what is object-based storage? Uh, what is block-based storage? That's okay. Um, but if you can articulate why you're going to use what for what purposes, uh, that gets you extra brownie points. Uh, remember, technology is changing all the time. Uh, demonstrate you keep up to date. So the interviewer is trying to see that uh, you are going to adapt yourself and learn the new stuff that's coming out. 
So for this question, as again, this video is recorded in December 2019. Uh, when this question is asked to you, you can mention S3 intelligent tiering, acquiring S3 using Athena, a multi-part S3 that I didn't put in the list uh, that we discussed before. Uh, note that EFS can be mounted to on-prem servers, uh, data in S3 can be compre compressed, etc. So this shows that you keep up with the latest announcements. And don't be afraid to ask dive deep questions to the interviewer for use case discussion. Okay, guys and girls, uh, that is the video. I know this is a little bit of a longer video. Uh, however, I wanted to do this comparison and finally got time to sit down and record the video. Uh, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. You guys have a happy holiday and Merry Christmas. I'll see you guys later. Bye.